Today's going to be a fun one. So we're going to be uh, looking at the niche finder tool at a couple different niches. So Kimberly uh, is going to be looking at a niche. I'm going to be looking at another niche. And we're really going to be validating these niches based on the numbers. And then we want to also spin it to have the right mixture between the numbers and the visual differentiation. So um, we know um, the days of just pulling a product off of the shelf on um to sell at Amazon are well and truly gone. You really have to, you know, create an exceptional product, an exceptional brand to stand out. And that's what we want to hone in on today um, after we first validate it with the numbers. Um, but before we get into it, just some house rules. So uh, Kimberly and I are both working from home. Um, I've got my neighbour whippersnipper <laughs> in the background. So if there's any noise, we apologise. Kimberly's got some birds on her roof that are making some noise. So um, bear with us, guys. Um, yeah. yeah, and if you have any questions, uh, you know, you can drop them in the chat or save them to, uh, for the end. We will do a live Q&A and we'll do our best to, to answer. As yeah. we and I can see some names coming through. So we, I think we've got a really cool section of um, around the world. We've got Vance from Hawaii. We've got Robert from Belfast. Um, Andre, Steph, Stephen, Darren. Hey, everyone. It's so great. to Oh, we've got... Rokshana from Sydney, it's awesome to see everyone joining in in the chat because we love hearing from you guys. It makes doing these live events so much more fun when everybody gets involved and um, yeah, just that community spirit obviously being respectful not just to us but to everybody else asking questions and we can really get a lot of value from helping each other and I think we'll learn a lot from today's lesson. Just tying in that left brain, right brain activity, um, we wanted to call this session finding the sweet spot. So looking at data and differentiation because some of us go right into the data and forget the creative aspect. And then some of us get lost in the creative side of things and, you know, may not pay attention to the numbers. So. Totally, totally. So do you want to kickstart us, Kimberly? Yeah, yeah. So let me share my screen. Alrighty, so this is Niche Finder. Um, it's one of my favorite tools. You can find it under the product research menu and you can see there's an easy mode and advanced mode. Don't be put off by the advanced mode. It's not as scary as it sounds. It just means you get to really tailor what you're looking for. So um, what I'm going to do today is to jump in and if I was looking, I like to call it a pocket money niche. It's something where maybe it's my first product launch. Um, I might not have the biggest budget to start with. I might be have, uh, working elsewhere and this is something I'm wanting to do um, in my spare time. You know, it might pay for the family holiday. It might help me pay down my mortgage. Just that, that product to sink my teeth into, get used to Amazon and get some extra money in my pocket. So... My search criteria is going to be very different to somebody who, you know, they're all in, they're an experienced seller, they might have a bigger budget, they might be looking for bigger numbers. So that's the context of what I'm searching for. And Eric's going to be going through, you know, that different um, category seller. So if I jump in, I've selected the kitchen and dining category. I really like that category because it ticks a lot of boxes in terms of there's usually not a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, it's usually if I can stay away from electronics, they're usually lightweight, easy to ship. Um, the price point's generally pretty good. Um, and if I dive into the filters, um, I'm not so concerned with these ones for, for the products I'm looking at, but I definitely want a healthy niche score. And the niche score takes into consideration a lot of your key selling points. And over here, we've got the search volume, I want something with a fairly healthy search volume, nothing crazy, but, you know, at least 4000 a month. I would like the average revenue for my niche to be over $10,000 a month. Um, ratings, you know, I, I want to have a fairly low uh, average rating. I don't want to be going up against super experienced sellers. And um, my launch budget, so this is probably going to be um, one of the most important to, to a lot of people. I want to cap that at 15,000. Um, you can obviously have that much lower if you need to. And my average price, sales price, I want it 20. So all I do is click search 
and the Zonguru Niche Finder tool goes through and filters all the niches to find those that match those exact conditions. And what you can do is if you really have a set of filters that you like, you can actually favorite them. So under here, you can see I've favorite, I've got this one here, I can come back to it at any time. Um, I can save different filters for different things and it saves me having to remember what is it that I'm looking for? What are those numbers that are important to me? And so let's, if we dive into the results, you can see there's, even though I've put in quite a few different filters, I've still got a lot of results here. Um, but the one that I, that really caught my eye when I was looking is these trays for coffee tables. So if, bear with me, I'm gonna go into the numbers a little bit for those creatives out there. We will get to the creative component. Um, but like I said, we're finding that sweet spot between data and differentiation. So if I'm looking at the data for this one, the first thing I really want to take a look at is the niche score and its different components. So the niche score is made up of the buyer demand, competition, investment and revenue potential. And I think there's often a little bit of confusion about what these um, factor in. So your buyer demand is basically how likely people are to buy within this product niche. So it's a combination of your search volume and your monthly sales. And you can see 64% is, is very healthy. Anything above 50 is generally a tick in my book. Obviously, the higher, the better. Um, but 64 is definitely very healthy. Competition. So Considering what I just said, that's below 50. It does raise a question mark, but for me, it's not an instant dismissal of this product. And I'll go into why. So competition is basically how well optimized the competitors listings are, how many ratings they've got. But I'm not so concerned with that if we can tie in a way to make our product stand out, to make it pop, because it will cut through that competition. It's worth noting and it probably makes it a little bit harder, but I can see instantly from the visuals down here, there is a lot of um, different ways to stand out, whether it's through color or materials or you know, adding a stand, there's, there's a lot of room for movement in that. So I'm not totally stuck on that figure and it's not an instant write-off for me. Whereas if my buyer demand was 38%, that probably would be a deal breaker for me. Um, so if I move over to investment, this is um, looking at the required capital outlay. Uh, how much is it going to cost to get three months worth of stock if you're selling on page one? Ideally, you know, your initial launch budget, 10 to 15K, seems to be the sweet spot for most FBA sellers. Um, so the greater the capital outlay, the lower this investment will be, 82% um, Awesome, and it fits well within my budget. You can see that the launch budget down here, it's saying roughly $9,000 to get this product online for three months, um, and it's well within the 15,000 I put in in my filters. So revenue potential, the last one up here, is the estimated profit sellers are making within the niche. It looks at things like sales velocity and the sales price, 71% well above my, my benchmark, um, I'm loving this so far. So like I said, even though one is not fitting the bill, it's not a deal breaker for me, particularly because it's in the competition space and I can see that there's room to, to move. Um, so they're not all the data points you've got. You can see here, there's so much more. And for people not data inclined, you're probably glazing over a little bit at this stage, but it is super important to stick with it and really make sure that those numbers match because it is the combination of the both. So I call these ones like the nitty gritty numbers. This is where you really get into the, the guts of it. So you search volume, it's above the 4,000 that I wanted. So I'm gonna give that one a tick. Shows me what the average monthly sales are, the average price points, great. Ideally, 20 to $25 and above is great because then there's enough profit in there um, and you're not having to sell on mass to get those figures up. Average ratings is really low in this one, really low. Um, and then you've got your revenue, average revenue per month. Like I said, the launch budget is great. 
Um, so with your average revenue, just to really stretch the friendship with those creatives, it's important to understand that this figure is your top line. That's what you're bringing in. It's not what ends up in your pocket. So in a perfect world, um, you work on the third approach, which is a third goes to your cost of goods, a third goes to Amazon, and a third ends up in your pocket as your net profit. Um, in reality, and I think Eric and I can both attest to this, especially when you're launching PPC, which is your advertising spending, can cut into that profit said big time so that um, in the long term you're looking for that 30 percent profit margin but initially on a launch you can find it's much less um, so if you're selling ten thousand per month you, know, you really want to have two to three thousand profit in your pocket but for initial launch you might have to uh, and it's a hard pill to swallow um, except that to get up in the rankings, it might be much less than that initially. So, uh, Eric, is there anything you wanted to add on that profit? Yeah, split? yeah, totally. Great points. Um, you know, usually for your first run um, on Amazon, um, it, it's going to be hard to make profit because you really do want to launch quite aggressively and be spending money on PPC and, you know, be lowering your price a little bit more because when you first launch, Amazon has a period called the honeymoon period. And that's where Amazon wants to actually help you rank to see if customers like your product. So in that period, um, I know John Tilly touched on this last week, you really want to um, lower your price, um, have PPC on and make sure that your, your listing is already uh, absolutely optimized. So that's just... Um, um, you may not make money on your first run, but it's important to have that long-term approach and view it as a long-term business where then in your second run, where you have your money back and you reinvest into more stock, then you start making a bit of money. 100%, yeah, definitely. So the other um, category, you've, you know, you've got the category of selling in, how many sellers are doing FBA as a percentage, the PPC bid price. So PPC, whenever you hear that term, think it, it's advertising. It's basically a um, the cost of, of bidding on that keyword and it works in an auction style format. So the highest bidder gets the display. Um, so the lower that is, the better or the, the cheaper it's going to be to run those campaigns. So it's a good metric to see up front. Um, keyword dollars. So this is the combined revenue for the top 25 listings in the niche per month. And the percentage that have that keyword in the title. So once you've gone through this, and if there are no big red flags or deal breakers for you, that's when you would send this over to the Chrome extension. And this is where you really get to see who's selling in that space at the moment. The numbers look great, um, but who am I going to be competing with? And the, it obviously list your competitors down here. A quick little trick that some people might not be aware of if I don't know if you can see it on my screen but there's a little number two here and if I scroll down I'll see a, a one and a three it basically shows me that that's the second most top clicked listing for the keyword so I can see who's really dominating that space um, I can also order the results by revenue Let me just move this to the side um, or the amount of sales to see exactly, you know, who is going to be the big hitters in this space that I am going to want to take on if I decide to push ahead. Um, and I can see visually from here that, you know, the, there's a little bit of differentiation, not a massive amount, but a little bit. So this is where I would start switching from that data focus to the creative or the differentiation focus. Um, because I'm really happy with these numbers. If I was looking for that pocket money niche, um, this one would probably be it. And to be honest, it's even probably slightly, um, it, it's moving more to, to a, a bigger niche because those numbers are very good. So with the differentiation side of things, um, have a look through and you can see, yeah, they're fairly similar. There's a lot of wood happening not a lot of colour apart from the, the blue one here. And I thought, you know, what are the different ways where I can differentiate this product if I was wanting to go into it? 
Uh, how am I going to stand out? And I thought there's two different ways to do that. One is based on colour. And that's where one of my favourite websites comes in, Pinterest. And all I did is type in Colour Trends 2020. And I can see there's a lot of these like mustards, greens and um, almost like those winter feels seem to be popping up quite a bit. And I'm not an interior designer by any stretch of the means, but I, it would look amazing with like a gold handle similar to this one, um, but offering that color choice that just simply isn't there at the moment. And that's a really easy change for a supplier to make. So if you said, look, I love this style, but I would like it in um, this darker green color, you're not reinventing the wheel in any stretch of the means, but it's certainly popping and being different. But you do probably want to take it that one step further and touch on, well, how can I be functionally different? What is going to be different about the application of my product? And I don't know if you all follow our Instagram page, but we found this one a little while ago and it is really a masterclass in what can we do different, but so simple. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little wooden groove here. And the way we are all living at the moment, especially those of us working from home, is that we are constantly on phones, iPads, um, electronic devices. And you can see that little groove lets you stand a device really easily up on that ledge. So not only that, they've attached legs to the tray, which just takes it to a whole nother level, but that simple groove converts a, a boring coffee tra table tray suddenly into you know, a food tray, media holder. It, it becomes so much more. It's now a multifunction product and a real benefit because remember you sell your products through benefits. How are you gonna benefit your customers? And that one's amazing. So if this was my niche that I was going to go into, I would change the color um, based around current trends and I would add that simple groove and yeah, hopefully, and with the numbers, I think that would push it to page one pretty quick. So I, I was really excited about this one. Um, let me stop sharing. Totally. Yeah, great points. Like the functionality of the product, um, that's yeah, one solid way to really differentiate to make it stand out. And then <clears throat> showcasing that in your hero shop, that's where, you know, that's where you're gonna get those clicks and then and, and start converting. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and share my screen now and I will go into a, a niche that is a little bit more of a, um, a niche that's more suited maybe for someone that's already selling on Amazon and has a bit of experience. So quickly share my screen. I can see Darren's made a comment about the video quality being a bit low. Um, we do record these sessions and we'll send them out to you an hour after they're finished. And I usually find in the playbacks, they're much clearer. Um, it really depends on your bandwidth. We're going live, so it can be um, caused by that. So yeah, wait, wait for the replay if you're having serious issues. Otherwise, yeah, bear with us. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so you can see within Niche Finder, um, I've set some different metrics compared to Kimberly. And again, what I love so much about the advanced mode is that you can really tailor it to exactly where you're at and what you're looking for. So I think Kimberly had 4,000 minimum search volume. I've got 10,000 here and the revenue I've got minimum 25,000, which means um, typically to, to have enough stock to rank on page one, um, my launch budget will be a lot higher. So this is more suitable for someone who has more capital and um, you know, uh, maybe a bit more advanced and willing to take the risk. I've also got here average price $30, which is a little bit higher, just to make sure that I can make enough profit. Um, so I've run the search and I can see here, there's some really interesting uh, products that come up. So Hot Pot, um, we've got Kitchen Canisters, but the one that stood out for me down here was bartender kit. And it stood out for me because firstly, the numbers are good. Um, just one point and what Kimberly mentioned also, so competition on the niche rater is zero. So although the competition is zero on niche rater, um, the buyer demand is high 
and the revenue potential is high. So I'm always going to be um, curious to check this niche out to see, okay, um, you know, there's demand here. What could I potentially do to to get into this niche um, despite there being high competition? So I've gone ahead and opened this up in the Chrome extension. And you do that just by clicking the three dots here and this little uh, jigsaw puzzle piece. And that'll open right here um, in Amazon for you. And the first thing um, that I see in this niche is that it's quite, you know, it's it's well done. You can see that it's the, the hero shots. They're very professionally done. Um, but if I open up the Chrome extension and, you know, look at some of these numbers, I can see that there is really high demand here. Some of the main competitors or some of the main sellers are doing 83,000, 67, 60, you know, and if scrolling down, I can see that it's really spread out. Almost everyone on page one is doing over 20,000 in revenue and even going slightly down, you know, it stays at over 10,000 for, for the first 60 products, I think it is. So, you know, that's, that's a really, really good demand and it's really, really spread out. However, that being said, and this is what I really want to focus on in this niche because um, the sellers here have done a really, really good job in visually differentiating not just by functionality or not by the design of the product because as you can see, um, you know, it's a, it's a bartender kit, so it's like a, a cocktail shaker and all the tools for creating cocktails. The actual product itself is the same in every image. It's the same, probably from, you know, a similar supplier, the exact same shaker, the exact same tools, but the ways that these sellers have differentiated, and this is another option, is by um, adding in value and bundling and adding in different components and displaying it in the hero shot really, really well. So you can see this top seller here, or this, this first place product, they're standing out by using this really beautiful bamboo stand that holds the cocktail kit. And on top of that, it's also got a, a recipe book in the background that they've included in the hero shot. And I can't stress how important that, that is to, in your hero shot on Amazon, you know, displaying your product, but also any value or anything else that you think can, can stand out. If you have a product that you're differentiating through um, its functionality, like Kimberly mentioned, then you need to show that. But other ways to stand out is by adding in value. And these guys here, they've gone something different. They have like a black turntable, probably spins around. Um, scrolling down, these guys here, they've all got like a little booklet included. These guys have a bag. Um, you know, these guys have their packaging, which really premium vibe. It seems like a slightly darker one as well. Um, these guys have their packaging and the bamboo stand. Uh, again, packaging, the turntable. Um, I don't know. It looks like they've got some, like a little booklet that's like set up like, like, a, like cards. Um, which is really, really cool. Um, we've got one here that's a pink design. So that's really the first one we see that the actual product is differentiated. The rest of them have added in you know, a ton of value and a ton of bundling in their hero shop. Uh, scrolling down, there's even some different ones. This one here is in like a little travel bag, which is really, 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 really cool, really cool and cool. And more than they're selling the, the cocktail kit, They've got all of the, the cocktail kit, you know, all the components shown once, whereas the travel bag is shown three times from different angles. And these guys I know are doing, you know, 20K plus um, revenue. Um, and, and the travel bag's really cool because, you know, that you, can, you can, you know, take that wherever you want and you can just pop it open and say, you know, let's go, let's make some cocktails. Um, scrolling down, yeah, here's the first kind of black kind of stand. Now, I'm not saying that this is a viable niche because it's definitely oversaturated and competitive. But if you were to take some of the, the methods that these sellers are doing and they're doing it really well and apply that into a niche that is less saturated, you can make, you know, an absolute killing because, you know, um, showcasing your product, but then showcasing, you know, adding in bundling with, with a stand or some extra value and insert cards and a book, it's just a great way of um, adding the to the perceived value of your offer and your brand. If your product, if you have um, a cocktail kit here 
and it's just the kit and it has nothing. But this one here has even just the book in the background, and they're the same price. You're as a customer, you're thinking, wow, they're the same price, but this one I'm getting more. So I'm going to purchase this one because I'm getting better value for my money. Um, and yeah, you can see it's all the way through. And that's why this niche is so spread out because there's so many sellers doing an excellent job. I've looked at some of these products deep and the photography is absolutely excellent. And applying some of these concepts in another niche that is less saturated, um, you know, can, can be very, very beneficial. Um, what are your thoughts, Kimberly? Yeah, I just circling back to the start, I thought it was really interested, interesting when you commented that the spread was really wide in terms of there's no three or four competitors dominating that space. Yeah. So okay. that's really important when you're looking at entering a niche because if you've got a couple of big players taking all the clicks, it's much harder to get in on that where if you've got one like this where it's spread, it's more in your favor. It's an, it's a more even playing field, but it makes sense when you start going through it because they're all doing really well. Um, yeah, there's definitely so. no lazy sellers that I can see in that space. So it would definitely be one I would be wanting to avoid. I don't see that as um, low hanging fruit, more of inspiration. Like you said, taking those um, tips and tricks and applying them to other niches where they're not doing that and you'll absolutely see results. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see with this too if the sales have spiked because of COVID. I know there's, there's a lot more people at home um, making cocktails than there were this time last year. So that would be really interesting to look at too. But um, yeah. awesome niche in terms of people are doing it really well. Um, yeah. But definitely one I would be really hesitant to jump in on and get trying to, to rank up there because you'd have to be an absolute master, a fantastic product and a big budget, I think, to get on exactly. Yeah, one there. And, and yeah, and I love also, you know, you know, some of these Photoshop as well that they've added in, like little lives in the background. This stuff makes a big difference um, in the current playing field at Amazon, like just standing out. Um, but mm. back to your point as well, like it would be super interesting to pop some of these into sales fight and see, you know, if they are spiking because of COVID. I guess, I mean, they definitely would be because we we know that the platform in general has just exploded this year. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny to see what niches have really taken off during COVID. I think we're all drinking and doing puzzles from what I've seen. <laughs> um, okay, we've just got a great question. It's so, so we touched on before about that price point and why um, we usually look at things above that $20, $25 range. And that's simply because you know, by the time you take your cost of goods out of that, Amazon takes their cut, you can be left with a really low um, amount left in, in your pocket. So the lower your, your selling price, the more you need to sell, basically. Yeah. So if you're selling um, a consumable good that can be bought in bulk and it's something that people repurchase, um, that, it, you know, you've got to weigh it up whether that sounds okay that sounds great that sounds great but if it's a one-off spend where someone's buying something once for for five dollars i would probably be steering clear of that just because you're then having to sell so many to get the same returns um it's definitely much harder with that lower price point um i'd be interested to know with the consumables because they're usually very competitive um, and you have a lot of big name brands typically in that space um just being cautious of who you're going up against so that would be a good one to see is there a, a big spread between the sellers or is there a couple of really big name brands taking that lion's share because as we touched on before that's going to be much harder um, well, what do you and yeah to add to that like if you're selling a, a ten dollar product or a twenty dollar product you have to keep in mind that one ppc click may be a dollar which means think about it, if one customer is clicking on your product, that's a dollar taken out of your profit margin. So if you're selling a product for 10 bucks and it costs you $3, you know, your COGS, plus Amazon fees, another two, $3, and then one click, and which you may not even convert the sale on another dollar, you're already looking at, you know, two, $3 profit, which is really, really low. So that's why we kind of recommend products over $30 because then you can, you have higher profit margins usually and then you can really factor in PPC 
and still make profit on top of that. Such a good point. Such a good point. So Vance mentioned what makes up the launch budget. So the launch budget is based on the idea of what it would take to have three months of inventory if you were selling on page one. So obviously everybody's situation is different, um, but generally that's how it's calculated. If that, if that helps with that. So um, it depends on your product, how expensive your cost of goods are can change it. It can change if you're using three PLs or all sorts of things, but it's a, a general guide and it usually fits pretty true. Yeah, so to kind of um, go on that, so if, if your pro, um, the average product uh, is making, you know, 500 sales a month, um, so to stay on page one for three months, you know, it would, it would take 1,500 products, it would take that monthly um, amount of sales, times it by three, and then, and then times it by the average selling price, and then take 30% away from that because we're playing by the, the thirds rule. So that will roughly be the launch budget. Cool. I love that we're getting some questions through. Has, yeah, um... guys, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Um, yeah, we're here to answer any questions you need now. So Yeah, we're all ears. So um, how familiar with the Niche Finder tool is everybody? Um, is it something that you use quite frequently? Um, do you understand it a little bit more now on its place in the research journey and obviously tying into you know, getting your data and then looking at the differentiation? What are your deal breakers when you're looking at a product? I mean, my deal breakers are usually the selling price point and search volume. Like I mentioned before, I'm not too scared off by competition. I um, essentially want to know that the demand is there. Um, and so is there a way to sort the best seller so B, bsr best seller um, rating range of certain categories so there certainly is uh, maybe i can lost my mouse here we go i'll share my screen again um and, and i'll show you a trick as well that you might find useful So with the Chrome extension data, you can really filter these columns however you want to see them. So this number here shows you how they're presenting on the page. So I can see what is number one at the moment, two, three, four, and five. Um, you've also got the ability, I don't know if you've used it before, but um, I quite looking at the best sellers and you can go through this and see right now what is the best seller for a particular category um, and you can really dive into the details there. I, it's a little bit probably different to what you're asking about. Let me, I'm just going to dive in and take a look. Do you ever use this function, Eric? Is that something that you? No, yeah. yeah. So from my beginning, I've never been um, a best a BSR type of um, product searcher. What I would um, do in my beginning searching for products, I would go kind of old school route and buy magazines. I'd yeah, buy a right. Of and I'd get a pen and paper and I just, I bought, I don't know, like five or six home kitchen magazines and then just started writing out every single product I could see. And then I'd go on Amazon, have some Guru open and just start process of elimination, going through each one, tick or X until I'm left with, you know, a handful. Yeah, right. Um, that, that's it. I like that. I like that. So this is what, um, when you dive into the best sellers, you can, I've just gone into kitchen and dining and you can, you know, do I want to look at what's selling best in kitchen and table linens, for example. Um, again, when using the Chrome extension, you can definitely order it by who, um, on that particular page. But if you're wanting to look at a really broad category, this can help as well. And it keeps going down. So, you know, placemats, who's who's the current bestseller for placemats right now? And you can see it's this one. Um, and the Chrome extension does work on these pages as well. Um, it's kind of fun to see, because obviously these are your big sellers. The, the huge numbers that you're dealing with sometimes in these categories can be mind boggling, but it's um, fun to take a look at from time to time. Click back. Totally. Cool. 
Great to hear, Vance. Um, yeah, that's awesome to hear that some of this stuff's landing. Um, we, we kind of just speaking openly from our own experience as well. So we're, we're just so glad to pass on any nuggets that we've learned from the journey to help you guys because we know, you know, it can be quite a rough journey. So we're, we're so happy that we're helping you guys out. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too when I was looking at the coffee ta trade tables, um, how many came straight off uh, Alibaba? They were yeah. almost identical pitches as well. So I know a lot of people, they'll find the niche and then they kind of get um, uh, overwhelmed by, you know, how do I find that supplier? Where do I go for, to from here? Um, but honestly, finding the niche is generally the time consuming part in, well, from my own experience, that's been the difficult part. Um, after that, it's, it's, because it really is the most critical part because the whole business is based upon the product. So that's the thing that you need to spend the most time on is um, finding a product. But there's also that mixture of, you know, you can't try to be a perfectionist and take forever. At some point you have to pull the trigger and say, okay, let's do it. But um, yeah, product, finding the niche is the, the hardest, longest, but also the most critical. Cause that's the foundation of, of your house. You know, that's, yeah. that's the meant I mean, the house being built. So. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, so if you've got any other questions, feel free to send them through. We're, we're all ears and happy to help. Um, we've also got our Facebook group, which is gaining quite a lot of momentum and we're getting some really good questions and community feedback in there. So if you haven't checked that out, it's the Amazon Seller Network. Feel free to jump in and say hello to everybody. It's um, open to all our Zonguru uh, users. We'd love to have you all in there. Here's a question. So talking about how specific we need to be when looking at niches. So that's a great, great question. So this is getting more into that keyword research yeah. um, and it opens up a whole new world. So with that tray for coffee, coffee table example, you're spot on. It can be called by so many different things. Um, and that's where the tool Keywords on Fire comes in. And it basically gives you a really big list of keywords that shoppers are using to find a particular product. And then once you've got that list, you can decide what keywords you want to target and really, um, I guess, throw that net out there to say, I'm going to um, expose my listing to this search, these searches for these keywords. And by placing them in the right spot in your listing, you can really optimize and start ranking for particular keywords, especially when you combine that with PPC. But we find when you're starting out, um, you can get a lot of traction really fast by using what we call longer tail keywords. Mm. So in the example, tray for coffee table is obviously a much more specific and longer keyword than someone typing in wood tray or um, table tray or something like that. So it, the, the longer word tray for coffee table aren't going to have as many searches, but if you are targeting that longer um, long tail keyword when others aren't, you're going to be the one that presents front and center for those shoppers. So even though you'll have a smaller search volume, you'll have more than likely higher conversions, higher conversions mean more money in your pocket. And over time, because Amazon wants to make money, they'll start noticing that you're converting on this product for them, you're making them money, they'll start to show your listing for those shorter tail keywords. So you can really kind of, it's a, we call it the halo effect. It's basically you tap into those longer tail keywords, you convert on those, and you get rewarded with um, being shown yeah. for shorter tail keywords over time. And we have a great article on this, don't we, Kimberly? We do. Let me see if I can find yeah, it, and I'll put it in the notes. On the halo effect, yeah, and really just um, hone in on how to best use it. Um, and it's... You know, a lot of sellers go straight for those really punchy short keywords, but that's where everybody is. So if you um, find those longer ones on the outskirts, you can get some massive results. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, so, uh, let us know if you have any more questions, guys. Keep them coming in. We've got a little bit of time left. Um, 
So yeah, it can be anything related to Amazon. Uh, even if someone wants to jump in, um, you can actually share the screen with us. And even, you know, if you're doing product research, present what you're doing and we can, um, you know, we can discuss it together. If we have any break. It takes, I know, we've only had one so far and um, yeah, it's, it's awesome, but it, it is a bit scary putting yourself out there. Um, so minimum search for those longer streets. So um, the idea with the halo effect or those longer term, longer um, keywords is you don't need to just choose one either. You can like, you can have 10, you can have even more, and you'll find that if you combine 10 of those longer tail keywords, it probably has the same search volume as that really short keyword. So um, it's being clever, developing that keyword list. Keywords on Fire does all the heavy lifting for you. But if you focus on 10 of those longer tail keywords, you'll probably get the same search volume as a short one anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's not having a single keyword focus. It's having um, a broad focus uh, to, I'm not explaining this properly. You can jump in, Eric, but well, it's um, like, Minimum search volume for a long tail keyword. There's no real, you know, minimum. But personally, I look for, you know, at least 1,000. One, two, 3,000 search volume can be considered a long tail keyword. Whereas a, lot, um, a short tail keyword, you know, typically if you're selling in a niche that has a lot of uh, demand, can have, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000. So like Kimberly said, if you're targeting um, three or four or five keywords that have one or 2,000, that can be making up 10,000 of your search volume in for keywords that aren't as competitive. And that's really the key thing with the long tail keywords is that they're almost like the undiscovered ones. They're the ones that are kind of pushed aside because people think they have low search volume. But by targeting them and targeting a lot of them, you can definitely build up more search volume and then organically start ranking for the ones that you know have 50, 60, 70,000 search volume but are more expensive to target through PPC. 100%. And I just had a look at the trays for coffee table niche I was looking at before. Only 24% had that keyword in the title. So there's, like Eric mentioned, it's about that competition. And if the bulk of your competitors aren't focused on that keyword, they're not optimised for it, they're not trying to capture those shoppers, but you are, you're going to see big results. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, Nina's got it. So, um, And it's also good. I'm not sure where you're um, dialing in from, Nina, but, you know, there's different phrases used in different countries as well that you can miss out on. So if I was going into the European marketplace, um, they might call a coffee table tray something completely different that I'm not aware of. If I'm going into the US, again, they could refer to it as something else. Keywords on Fire um, helps cut through that and will give you the keywords that um, are converting. So and that helps. can also include misspellings. That can include another language. I know that a keyword that I've recently been targeting is a Spanish keyword because, you know, there's a lot of Hispanic-speaking people um, in America. And misspellings, yeah. well, all of these come up and they're still considered, um, you know, long-tail keywords. They have a little bit more less search volume, but together with many others, you know, it can be powerful. Yeah. 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 So it's um just if we go all the way back to the beginning, if you take away anything from today, it's combining both the data and the differentiation. So, you know, the, the tools are there. Um, it's just applying them. So, you know, going through all your numbers, as painful as it might be for our creatives out there, um, you, you really need to do it and also don't get so lost in the data that you forget to really make your product different and pop. It's, yeah. um, it's, it's a balance and it's yeah, not. And absolutely. And the, the one thing that I was really trying to also um, display with the bartender kit is that visual differentiation and differentiation doesn't purely have to be and um, what I was trying to get is that there's many different ways that you can stand out by bundling, by adding more value, by adding another feature to your hero shop that pops. You know, these are all different ways that you can still stand out on Amazon. Yeah, for sure. There, any other questions, guys? Or we 
All righty, guys. I think we're going to wrap it up unless yeah. we get a last second question. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm running an auction. It's like, we're going, <laughs> going. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for your time, guys, and we're doing this every second week. Thanks, Beck. Um, yeah, great to hear. Thanks, Beck. Um, awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good yeah. day, and we'll speak soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.